Uh, how are we for sound? Okay, great. First off, hi, Mom. Uh, thanks, everyone, for joining me uh, today. Lots of great talks here. I'm, I'm happy you came to mine. Uh, what already is a front runner for the talk with the longest title. Let's see what other awards I can win. Um, so uh, I'm talking about databases, and I'm, I want to tell you about the compute power of databases and APIs beyond the ORM. Uh, I'm what I'd call a technical lead at a startup in town called ClearBank. We're financial tech. Um, the origin of this talk comes from me having to put on the hat of a data analyst. Um, I've got, if you hit my, if you want to follow along with the slides, we're, uh, you can find them on my GitHub, WXGeorge. Uh, the, there, there'll be some code snippets, so if you have a connection, this, that you may find that helpful. Um, so the origin of this talk is me needing to put on the hat of uh, a data analyst and finding that uh, I have a background, a strong background in software engineering, and I'm comfortable with mat math and statistics, but I haven't done a lot of data analysis in the past. Uh, so when we were asking some very basic questions about our users and our data, I thought, no problem, I'll spin up a, a, a snapshot of my production data, plug a, a terminal into it, start doing some computations. And I wrote some code that looked like this, uh, where I was interacting with my objects through the ORM. And I, I punched some code in, and I pressed go, and I went to make myself a coffee, and when I came back, uh, the code's still running. And I had a lot of time to think about why it was still running, so much time that I planned to talk for PyCon. Um, and so this is, uh, this, is a, this is the foundation. And so I know we've got a, a mixture of uh, folks that come to PyCon. We've got a really diverse audience. So I'm giving this uh, background as some, some texture. I know some of you will be application developers, some of you will be come from business intelligence, uh, sides of things, uh, and I want to speak to, you know, I'm hoping there'll be uh, a different story that's being pulled out for, for different ones of you, um, different groups of you. Uh, so what I would describe the, where our technology ended up and, and where uh, the situation we found ourselves in, by the end we found we had built ourselves some lightweight systems for business intelligence. And so we were, we were uh, and continue to be in a place where we're consistently asking very new analysis questions, trying to get, trying to f execute these analyses very quickly, and trying to avoid setting up too much infrastructure around this analysis. So unlike some of the financial reporting that you might have in business intelligence, where you have some data warehousing, where you might have some significant uh, summary uh, statistics that you might generate nightly off your reporting, and that becomes the foundation of your reporting, that didn't fit for the kinds of reporting that, that we're doing, which is pretty ad hoc, and we're launching new programs all the time and trying to understand those programs. So I want to talk, uh, uh, to develop this, uh, the technology we developed uh, involved really leveraging some of the compute power of the database, which was new to me. Uh, so a quick overview for the talk. Um, I want to sketch uh, and review quickly how I think about databases as a platform. Because I think application developers typically come to this through the ORM. And the ORM is the right tool for so many of our, uh, so many of our problems. When it comes to specifying application logic, when we're thinking in terms of single objects, this really is the right, uh, it, it, uh, the right interface or a great interface. But there are, uh, the ORM is not the only um, interface to a database, and it doesn't capture the full power of what we can do with, with databases. So I just want to explore what the ORM does well and, and uh, as a jumping off point to accessing the more general compute power of the database. And we'll start by running through some examples of SQL. SQL is very good at dealing with the contents of your database as a collection. And this is where the difference between an ORM, uh, the ORM starts to fall down. ORMs are concerned with objects, where SQL gives us the, the, capa the capacity to compute over collections. And that's, that's where the strength is. And where we will uh, end up is, is looking at some other APIs for managing the kinds of programs and reporting pipelines that we get from using that more general uh, compute engine of the database. So that's, that's the sketch. So let's start with, with databases. Um, I continue to marvel at data, the relational database when I'm, when I'm working with it, when I give it some big queries and, and the kind of optimizations that I'm understanding more of what's happening behind the scenes. And this talk, in some ways, started as a love letter to da databases. But uh, there are, these are a platform for our applications, and they appear everywhere. And the, the, most, the first thing I think people think about is the way databases are responsible for the persistence of our application objects. And of course, this is a critical goal. Um, of course, where a lot of the technologies that uh, constitute uh, 
the database and where the sophistication of that machinery is, is in coordinating persistence with concurrency because the database is this platform where you know, we're able to scale horizontally to a point, but considerably on, on top of. And, and databases are able to coordinate that persistence with these concurrent reason rights and with this fabulous capacity for computing through, through SQL. But it's, it's through the persistent side that I think people are, are mostly think about databases. I, I certainly did. Um, and, it's, and it's that world of persistence where the ORM really shines, right? So uh, if I think about an application while it's running, um, uh, I've, I've got my Python application that's running and it's talking to a database and they've got a little pipe between them. And the only way to interact with the database is through that pipe and my application has to generate SQL to, to do the routine operations of persistence. When I want to create an object, I need to write an insert statement. When I want to update the values of an object, I need to uh, have an update. If I want to delete, there is some boilerplate to, to create these objects to begin with. Um, happily, this, uh, this SQL is not something we have to think about very often, and this is where the ORM shines, right? This, this, this SQL is extremely repetitive, and it's just full of boilerplate, and um, the ORM uh, does a great job of letting us interact with objects and uh, um, interacting with objects and forgetting about these the, the, the things we need to do to, to just get them in and out of that database. Uh, I know when I started working with Django's ORM, uh, I was look, one of the questions you find yourself asking is how do I compute upon this data? And here are a few snippets from the page on aggregations, which is the main uh, computing power we have access to directly from, from the ORM. And uh, I recall my experiences with this API at first, and I found it a bit confusing that uh, while we're able um, to access the associations that are, that are modeled in our database well and reach through and aggregate any single column through any association that we've set up in our model, that's where the, the compute power stops naturally. And of course, there's lots of things you can ram through that ORM if you, if you know it well, and lots of people do that. Uh, and this is how I began with doing some of these larger uh, 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 reporting tasks and computing tasks on the data, was working through the ORM, but that felt awkward. And, and uh, it, uh, this is unavoidable because the ORM is solving a really focused problem, and this is not where the ORM shows its strength. So what I'd like to do now is I'd like to move through a simple example of some reporting. Uh, we've got some basic data that we want to do some aggregation and we want to build uh, a, a simple visualization off of. So uh, here, I, here I'm just trying to say our underlying model is we've got some user table and we've got creation times with those users and what we want to compute is um, the graph of uh, signups over time. So this is a very simple task and I'm sure uh, uh, many, if not all of you, could write right now some SQL, even through the ORM, that would, that would achieve this computation for you. But I want to do this as a warm-up, and I want to reach for some more general facilities within SQL uh, that will allow us to express not only this computation, but much more ambitious ones. So let's do some SQL review really quickly. Um, the first, uh, one of the essential powers that the database gives us, we can aggregate over tables. So, so here's an example, select count star from users. This, is, this gives us the height of our table, the number of rows. Um, uh, of course, when we aggregate, we can do more than just over a table by itself. We can uh, break down that table into a bunch of categories and, and aggregate over the categories themselves. So if, if some of you, when looking at uh, the original picture, we want to track signups over time, we could just project the creation time to a month and then we could aggregate over those groups and that would give us the raw data that we were after. Um, but uh, so this, this notion of aggregation I take as given and people are, I think, generally familiar with. But where the power comes from this, this really is an incredibly powerful engine. We just have to see how to mix it with some, with some other facilities. So uh, what isn't obvious to first-time users of SQL is that the categories that you're, you're aggregating over need not be just the value of some column in your database. So already, we've actually reached to some reasonable power here. And this is a query I find myself running often because it's, or this kind of query, because this is actually the base input into a histogram. So I'm, I'm grouping my users into uh, my output there. You know, I have 100 users between 10 and, uh, and, tw and 20. I have, you know, E, but each, uh, each row represents a bucket of users according to some uh, criteria that's useful for, for my analysis. 
Now you might uh, take a look at this and say, well, hey, wait a minute. Your user table won't have an age column in it. Uh, age is not a static property of a user. It, in fact, it's something dynamic that comes from comparing your birthday to the, the current moment in time. So that is something that needs to be computed if you're going to do this, this kind of analysis. Um, uh, however, uh, we can do this translation. So I want to show another structure, which is something I use all the time when I'm, when I'm writing SQL, which is um, this is a particular way of formatting what might be called a subquery. And another way of looking at this presentation is a common table expression. But this is really important uh, in a lot of our reporting workflows because it lets us build these pipelines in a, in a uh, very clear and, and manageable way. Uh, so what's actually happening here is I'm, I'm factoring out the computation of age for the users into a, a first query. So I'm building a table on the fly, which is users with age. And all I'm doing is I'm taking my basic users table and I'm annotating that table with an additional column, which is age at this, this moment in time. Uh, but a nice property, and, and here's one where the, the compositional properties of SQL come into play and let us reach to these arbitrary computations, is that the output of a query can be thought of itself as a table and then used arbitrarily down the line. So this is what we're, what we're doing with these kinds of programs, is we're building a pipeline of data, starting with some tables and, and moving them through. So I've created one table where I've annotated my users with age, and then I've pumped that back into my, into my histogram calculation. Of course, as I've already hinted, you can play this game again. And so if you, uh, if you didn't like the way this code looked, where I've repeated the calculation of the bins for my users, that itself could be factored out into another table up front. Um, one of the really nice things, uh, uh, one of the really nice properties of relational databases is they have a lot of smarts for looking at these queries and rewriting them into a, a way that will be executed efficiently relative to your underlying tables. So even though I've split this out into a couple of different tables, uh, I've written this as if there are multiple queries. The database is free and, and under many circumstances will compress these into a single table scan under the hood. And so this is hinting at some of the real power of the compute engine, some of the really sophisticated machinery that we're able to tap into when we express our computations in these kinds of programs. Um, so I've talked about how queries themselves are tables, and, and they might be ephemeral tables. They might exist for only the lifetime of your query, but this is very convenient for generating these pipelines. The last uh, critical building block in SQL is, is the join, which people will typically be familiar with. And I think the first time uh, you see a join, you're usually, you've got some data that's just partitioned across a couple of tables. And what the join is doing is reconstructing these objects that you factored out into these smaller pieces. Um, the, this is my diagram for, for join, right? The, the operation of a join takes two tables and builds a bigger table where every pair of rows from the starting pair appears in, in the new table. The way I like to think of this computation, it's cut off on this slide, unfortunately, is I first think of the the join is blowing the table up into something really big, and then we're selecting it down to, to something smaller. And while this is a simple um, observation, or this is a simple way of phrasing it, the significance of this is we can express arbitrary joins. And this, the, reaching for joins that are not just unfactoring uh, uh, a fragmented model into some true denormalized table, but they let us do these arbitrary computations. So uh, with these tools in mind, I want to return to this thing that we're trying to compute that I initially wrote in this iterative manner, where I'm, I'm taking all the users in my database and I'm just grouping them into sign-up months and I'm uh, counting the sign-ups in each. So again, the, I expect many of you to have in mind how you would compute this in SQL with a single query. You might extract from the sign-up date, you might project that uh, you know, something that's a full date in time down to a year and a month, and then you, it's just one group by to aggregate. But I want to use some of the, 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 the building blocks that I've just outlined to, to show uh, a, different, uh, a different way to do this computation that, that generalizes quite nicely. So uh, here's how I have started to think about expressing this kind of, of computation. Uh, the, so we've got a pipeline of queries here. And we're starting with a month's table. So here I'm already applying another trick. 
that you can do uh, when you're reporting is that the tables that are involved in your queries don't need to start f being in your database. They don't, need, they, they don't need to be derived from the tables that are in your database. There are lots of ways of generating them. And so we're unrolling a loop. We have to unroll a loop with this calculation. So at some level, there's, a, there's something that's representing the iterations for the loop. And that's what this first table is. I've hard coded it in with um, a month name and a start and end date. And I've picked that representation because it's particularly easy to do a classification of date when you have the start and end date. And you don't need to know anything about the, the API of your uh, underlying, um, uh, the date time APIs of your underlying database. But so I've written this in three steps. Uh, the first step is to give this months table, which is the unrolling of our loop. The second step is to annotate the user table with that sign up month. And the third query is doing the group by the aggregation. We've got now each. We've got our buckets, and we're just counting the number in each bucket. And this gives us the data that we need to, to draw this graph. So again, that was the warm up. Um, so the, let's do something more sophisticated, which represents the kind of computation that we're going to do more often when we're doing some kind of analysis. Um, uh, so I'm assuming that our inputs are two tables, one where we have, we've split our users into classes and we're trying to understand changes in behavior from our users as a result of some interaction, whether that's using our product or maybe we've done some marketing with them. So this is like, we have some kind of treatment that we're subjecting our users to. So, so one table we have as input, we have all our users and we have them binned into two kinds of treatments and we have uh, the time at which we treated these users, because it it, I'm imagining in this scenario, it's not homogenous. The time is not homogenous across all users when we administered these treatments. So the other basic input I have for this model is for e I have whatever constitutes activity on my platform. And so for each user, every time, it, uh, if this was Facebook, it might be every action on the platform, whether it's posting something, uh, uh, accepting a friend request, liking a post, these might all appear under uh, the events table. So these, these, are the two, these are the two starting pieces of data I have. And what I want to generate is um, I want to look at the average change in activity be before and after the treatment. So uh, there, this is, perhaps this is a somewhat involved example, but this really is the kind of thing that we're doing quite often when we're trying to measure the effects and, and trying to understand some of our user behavior. So. We've got average activity before and after a treatment. We want to normalize that across our users because we want to understand the effect of the, the treatment. Um, and then we'd like to generate uh, some kind of uh, distribution. We know there is a distribution on the, the, the effect sizes. Um, so I'm specifically looking at the ratio of the average activity before and after the treatment. That's the, that's the function that I'm thinking of. And that's, that's the function I'm, uh, uh, it's the distribution of activity change ratio, and, but I have, I have two colors there, which is I have two classes, so I have two, two treatments. So that's, that's the, uh, the problem I'm, I'm trying to solve. Now, if these are my starting tables, um, I actually can generate this entire, uh, uh, I can generate all of this data in a SQL pipeline. And here we see a more reasonable application of these techniques. You might have said, uh, uh, maybe your user scale wasn't that small. Maybe you, you felt you could pull the items that you were iterating over, aggregating over into memory. Um, uh, but in this case, I'm imagining we have a lot of data that we need to, to chew through, and, and these iterative approaches, pulling them into the interpreter is really a, a huge bottleneck. So we would set up uh, a data pipeline. Um, uh, so the way I think about this computation is more or less how I've described it. and, and uh, th this takes a little bit of practice, but if you think about the, the steps of your computation and you think about this building of a pipeline, we can map the individual calculations we need to do very cleanly to single tables and do whatever calculations we like. So in this pipeline, I'm starting with users. I'm imagining they're tagged by treatment. Um, uh, next, I'm generating two tables that have a similar structure which is isolating the events before and after the treatment for each user. So I've got uh, a slightly different window before and as after. I'm pulling out 30 days of events behind a treatment and seven days after a treatment. 
Um, and so we see a first aggregation um, to generate. I've got these two tables where each row has a user and a date before or after. And, and the number of events from those tables we're able to generate uh, activity measures, which is the average over these days um, of activity. And I'm able to generate, uh, taking those activity tables, now I've got a table for before and after, each with the average number of events per user. I can join these on users and I can get my increase factor. So in a few steps, I've, it, I can project this data that I have down to the raw input I need to draw these, um, uh, to understand the, these factors of increase and, and to draw these distributions. At this point, uh, at this point in this kind of calculation, you might output your results into another data processing library that you're comfortable working with. That could be Pandas, that could be Excel, that, that, that could be R. And uh, we have achieved a significant event here of doing some compression of some large data down into something that we're ready to do some analytics on. Uh, however, it also happens to be particularly convenient to uh, you can go the rest of the way in SQL very easily. The kinds of manipulations that you need to go from these single functions into a distribution are, are straightforward using the things we've talked to already. And I find myself actually writing more and more of this logic in SQL. I find it, uh, uh, there are certain, there are a lot of calculations that are done very, very naturally in SQL and I didn't realize. And so I find myself, uh, the more I write SQL, the more I find myself getting a feeling for the, the difference in computations between uh, things that are done very well in SQL and things that are more appropriate in another library. So part of the point of this, uh, uh, or rather what should be understood as a, a, a refrain and something that underlies this talk, I'm not trying to suggest that SQL is something that you can solve all of your computational problems in, right? That we know that there are, there are certain uh, models, general statistical models, or some pattern recognition things you might be doing, some machine learning models, where it's much more appropriate to output to, to pandas or, or something else, right? Where we, uh, but, but there are a great many kinds of analyses that can be very efficiently executed in, in SQL and, or doing some pre-processing for those general models. So I think this is a, a, a valuable toolkit. Um, Why well, I'm also talking about this for, uh, yeah, yeah, it's a valuable toolkit. Th something I've touched on, um, and I'm running a bit low on time because uh, we're a bit squeezed here, but uh, we've talked a little bit about how pushing computations into the database allows us to avoid a lot of rounds of interaction and pulling intermediate representations into Python. And that's where we do get a ton of efficiency. Um, the other area where we get efficiency is I, I hinted at this earlier, but there's this incredible machinery inside the relational databases that is, re represents decades of research in computer science, both academic and industrial, where uh, to take a general query and find efficiencies throughout that execution. And that machinery is not going to be at your disposal when you're writing in, in Python. Python's a general purpose programming language. The task of optimizing a SQL query is a much easier one because it's a constrained set of problems. And so SQL is very good at specifying computations and our, data, and our relational engines are very good at, at finding those structures, doing tricks like throughout the flow of data, we're reordering some calculations, reordering some selections to keep the average size of the data that we're chewing on to a minimum. That's, that's an important thing that the query optimizer is doing, um, which you would write manually if you're trying to do this thing um, in Python. That's not at our, at our fingertips in Python. Um, so the last subject I want to touch on is where do you go uh, once your SQL programs, your SQL queries become very, uh, grow in complexity? And this is something uh, uh, any organization will, will need to deal with. We, we already saw, if we were looking uh, at the earlier pipeline I generated, there's a lot of similarity between uh, these two queries, right? And, and I was describing the earlier computation, the, the symmetry between these tables was something before and after a treatment, but the structure of the SQL is, is very similar. Um, so managing this kind of complexity is uh, a, very important, uh, a very important thing. And as you, as you grow these queries, you'll need to find some way to break them down. This is, uh, uh, this is complicated. This is, this is repetitive. So one generic approach is that of 
what is termed data warehousing. Like if we had some, if these were computing around something that uh, was a significant intermediate value, we might set up something to run nightly so we could count on a table of summaries being there. And that would exist in a certain scale of organization. And you would do it for a certain kind of intermediate result. This is not a good example of such a result. These are ephemeral uh, things that are particular to this, this pipeline. Um, at ClearBank, we've avoided creating this kind of infrastructure just because of the stage that we're at. And again, the kind of analyses we've been running are, are varied and, and very different from, from day to day. So we haven't found things that are worth machining and, and getting into this uh, uh, repetition. But this is where some more expressive APIs um, uh, and other APIs for interacting with databases come into play. So when you're looking at these walls of text, it, it, this is the problem. They are, they are text. And text by itself doesn't have nice properties of, of composition. And it's these more general APIs that give us uh, these properties of composition. So the one I've started working with is SQL Alchemy, um, the, the SQL Alchemy, the core library. In, in fact, uh, I've done a lot of work in, in Ruby, but there are parallels of this in, in Ruby as well. Um, and the significance of this API is we, get a, we are given lower level objects to, to build with, but these objects have the same compositional properties that of the, the types that they're representing from the database world. So if you have an ephemeral table that's being generated throughout your computation, the, you have a representative in Python where the objects, uh, where the operations that can be applied to that to those objects reflect the things that the database can do with that table. So an ephemeral table can be selected upon, can be joined against. And so this is certainly a lower level API. I think when I first looked at the SQL Alchemy project, I found, well, I, it wasn't immediately obvious to me where this complexity would be useful, because we have to do more to model. Um, and it's different from the kinds of uh, uh, aggregations we saw from, from the Django world. Um, but uh, uh, this is an example of places where this complexity is, is uh, worthwhile. I think that's it for time. Um, I hope this has been useful uh, uh, to some of you here. Uh, I hope I've given you some tools and enriched your perspective in some way. I'd love to hear if that's the case, and I'm happy to take any questions uh, I'm around for the rest of the conference. So thank you all.